Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is an interesting one on Christian education. This is lesson number 10 in that series for December 5 of 2020. And the title is Education in the Arts and Sciences. Hmm. That's a pretty big part of education as I remember it in the liberal, in the liberal colleges. So, as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow our heads now before you, recognizing your presence always with us. We ask a special guidance as we study now uh, this lesson, how we can see you in, in what happens in our schools and what happens in our homes. May we all understand more clearly what should be our commitment to Christian education is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, folks, how do you understand the words, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork? That's the King James Version. Let's look at another version, Jim. Psalms 19.1. How clearly the sky reveals God's glory. How plainly it shows what he has done. American Bible Society. Yeah, that's now, the, if the good news translation. You identify his glory, we say is his character. Mm -hmm. That's a, how he is. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Does looking out into a star uh, out at night into a starry heaven say anything to you about God? Yeah. Does looking about us at our world tell us of God's handiwork? I can tell you that um, we ran across a a nursery guy runs a nursery plant nursery, and he kind of got interested in our place, and we said you know, would you be willing to come and see if you can redo it so it looks nicer? And he and his guys have been working our house and they put in a whole bunch of nice new plants. It, it just it just makes you think, it's, yeah. it's so nice. It just, yeah. you know, sparks, sparkles the day, you know? Well, the arts and sciences are considered to be an important part of education. So what is the role of the biblical perspective in education? Does reading a text at the beginning of class and offering a short prayer make the class into one that is based on biblical principles? I don't think that's adequate. No. How should teachers integrate their understanding of God, of creation, and of God's role in our lives and in the world into every aspect of their teaching? Let us be honest. As human beings, we cannot fully comprehend what it means to have an omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent God. We, 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 we know by definition what those words mean, but we, we have no comprehension. I mean, how can God be with me and he's with the people in China at the same time? And that kind of stuff we just... I think, I think it depends a bit on what textbooks uh, lectures and... Yeah. Uh, I remember when I first did biology, it was one of ours. It was very good. I thought it could have had more in it, but it it steers some of these kids in the right direction. If you go nine out books, and we've got to have some improved ones than what I saw years ago. Yeah. Well, do we understand what it means when we say that our very lives, every heartbeat, every breath only happen because of God's power? If God chooses to make a world that operates according to orderly laws, and then scientists that are, who study those laws, does that give them permission to leave the creator and the sustainer of the universe out of their thinking? See, the point is, if you study laws that they're always there and they always work perfectly, it's easy to think that, well, that's just the way it is. Yeah. You don't have to think that God is the one who makes it happen like that. Let us think of some examples of God's activity in our world. A human baby develops from a fertilized egg of microscopic size, and everything is determined by those little DNA strands. It becomes a living, breathing human being. And it's interesting to notice how the mother's body changes to accommodate the pregnancy. There are hormonal changes, there are physical changes, the abdomen, ab abdomen swells right out in front of her as she approaches months seven, eight, and nine. 
it is impossible to hide the fact that she is bearing a child. And I didn't realize this until relatively recently. I think there's a reason why Mary went off to visit her cousin, Elizabeth, when she was in the last months of her pregnancy. It wasn't just by accident. No, no. Well, think of how these changes in her life prepare her for being a mother. There's no question about the fact that what well, is coming. And I, re I do remember a pregnancy I was involved with at one point, and this lady was lying on the table delivering a baby, swearing that she was not pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes, it does happen. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, for Especially a mother saying, no, 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 no my no. daughter hey, no. cannot be pregnant. For a child who for months or years has been wanted for and prayed for, yeah. think how exciting it is to watch it grow. God could have made the whole growth process somehow be hidden, hidden away, but this is so much better. Look at two or three verses from Scripture that talk about God's creative power. Romans 1. I'm reading from Romans 1, verses 18 to 21. God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil of the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. God punishes them because what can be known about God is plain to them, for God himself made it plain. Ever since God created the world, his invisible qualities, both his external power and his divine... Eternal power. Eternal, yeah, I missed that one. It's the brightness and his divine nature have been clearly seen. They are perceived in the things that God has made. So those people have no excuse at all. They know God, but they do not give him the honor that belongs to him, nor do they thank him. Instead, their thoughts have become complete nonsense and their empty minds are filled with darkness. That's from the Good News Bible. Wow. So what does God's anger have to do with his creative power? We need to remember when we read verses like that, and there are many in the Old Testament, and there are quite a number in the New Testament, we need to remember that God's wrath or his anger is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own destructive choices. And there's Psalm 19 we've already looked at, and Nehemiah 9, 6 will support that. Think of all that our world has been through since creation. Did God design our world to withstand the ravages of a worldwide flood? Clearly he knew it was coming. Yeah. And think of what human beings are doing that impacts our environment today. I mean, there's global warming and whether or not that's true or isn't true, or whether we're just in a cyclic phase, that's still is getting warmer. Yeah. Is it possible that some of the human-caused effects on the environment eventually will lead to some of the plagues? That's yeah. possible. Maybe, yeah. Education, especially at the higher levels in our day, is totally dominated by the idea that we evolved after the Big Bang, and then from random forces that have led all the way to where we, uh, have all, where we are now. According to that theory, our world was created when a massive piece of rock collided with a large meteorite and heated up the world until we end up with the shape and size that we now have. Someone has pointed out that the, the fact that if you could shrink our world to the size of a billiard ball, it would be smoother than the billiard ball. <laughs> it, you know, even the amount of the, you know, Mount Everest, those things, things, in proportion to the size of the world would make not even a bump on the side of a billiard ball. Well, does that sound like something that might have happened as a result of two massive heavenly bodies crashing together? <laughs> you just, yeah. Science is based on the idea that any truth, this is what scientists would tell us, the hardcore people, that any truth must be testable in the laboratory. It must be clearly understood and repeatable in other labs uh, to confirm it as a scientific fact. So how does the one-time creation of our world and the subsequent flood fit into that scenario? And if you run across somebody who's absolutely dedicated to the thing that ha everything has to be tested 
in, in, in the laboratory under, under, micro, under microscope or whatever, ask them if they believe in George Washington. Is he, can you test him under the microscope? No. How many students today would even know who D George Washington is? <laughs> well, I hope that's not true, but I mean, any historical fact, yeah. they accept what they want to accept, but they deny what they don't want to, they don't want to accept. Yeah. So if you're going to accept any historical evidence, then okay, where are you going to draw the line? You better have a rational reason for drawing the line. Obviously it does not. However, Matt, neither does the Big Bang. So how should Christians respond to those who believe that the Big Bang is the only possible explanation for what we'll find in our world today? Well, the scientists are not the only ones. Uh, the Pope himself is saying, I, you know, you don't need to remember the persecution that we killed 60 million people. Yeah. You don't need to. Look how good we are. Yeah. See? <laughs> So think of a God who makes those fabulous flowers. They look so nice, but not only look nice, think of how they smell. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and why did he need to do that? Well, why is it that birds that are not as colorful tend to have the best songs? <laughs> why are male birds more attractive? Yeah. Read... I mean, and there's probably an explanation for that. <laughs> the females are more likely to be sitting on the nest and they, want, they don't want to be drawing attention to themselves while they're sitting on the nest. But, but see, that means, that means, you know, someone planned that. Someone thought that through. It had a purpose. Yeah. Oh dear, we were not not supposed to have any purposes in great creation, right? <laughs> Psalms 96 verse 9 says, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before, tremble before him all the earth. So what do we mean when we say the beauty of holiness? Is it true that beauty is in the eye of the beholder? If you remember some of our previous lessons, we say, well, you're not too sure about the beauty of holiness. Think about all the awful appearance and so forth of everything that's against God. Just think of all the stuff that's going the other direction as fast as they can. It's certainly not beautiful. But when you consider the, what the Israelites did in making the ark, yeah, that was a work of the work of art. Finesse and yeah. yes. Think of the incredible process that it takes place. That takes place every time you see something and recognize it. Okay, you see something instantly, or I see something. Yeah, I know you. I, you know, I met you before. Okay, what happens? That incredible process happens in the eye itself. It sends electrical signal. It passes those pass things through the brain. It comes at the back of the brain here. And then it, it, these two pictures have to integrate it to give you a 3D version. And then your mind has says, okay, now I have to check all that against all the memories that I have here. And finally it says, oh yeah, I, there's another memory like that back here. That's who it is. It just happened by accident, of course, you understand. Yes, uh, in fact, um, Darwin uh, uh, confessed, he says, there is no way how the eyes work can be explained. Yeah. There is no way. And it just so, could not happen. So much more complicated yes. than even he understood at the it time. Takes, that's yeah. the point. So that mental image, in your finding your band, it has to, you know, and you're, you're also making judgment at the same time, whether it's beautiful, whether it's, not beautiful, whether it's, you know, colorful, not colorful, all those judgments, it just, you don't stop. How to respond to what you see. Yeah. Coming Are you supposed tonight. to be fearful or? What? Coming in tonight, when I got down through the windy bits and straightened out, there's this massive orange orb just about yeah. to sink. That in itself is phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And even, even with the smoke around it, it was still beautiful. And you know what gives it the color? The, yeah, the uh, pollution. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's not really the answer. It must be some reflection. It's the colloidal particles. The microscopic stuff doesn't change the color at all. It has to be a little bit larger particles. They're called colloidal particles, something a little bit bigger in the air that absorbs some light and does something to it and gives okay. it that color. Okay. And who arranged that? Yeah. Mm. I mean, God forbid that we have a nice, colorful sunset, right? <laughs> well,
Well, anyway. And there's still so much of beauty left in our world. What must yes. it have been like when it was first created? Proverbs 20, verse 12 says, The Lord has given us eyes to see with and ears to listen with. Isn't that surely true? Yeah. So if we recognize that it is God who is the creator of all that is beautiful, doesn't that tell us something important about God? Charles, I think that's yours. God would have his children appreciate his works and delight in the simple, quiet beauty with which he has adorned our earthly home. He's a lover of the beautiful, and above all that is outwardly attractive, he loves beauty of character. He would have us cultivate purity and simplicity and quiet graces of flowers, of the flowers. Ellen White, how could you argue with this? Yeah. Ellen White, Steps to Christ, uh, eight, page 85, paragraph 3. But well, we need to recognize, and we all probably do, that not every beautiful thing is pure and holy. Look at some examples, both sides here. Genesis 3, 6. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat, and she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, and he also ate it. Proverbs 6.25 Don't be tempted by their beauty. Don't be trapped by their flirting eyes. And Proverbs 31.30 Charm is deceptive and beauty disappears, but a woman who honors the Lord should be praised. Amen. I think you could have added one more verse. It says, I go in through all the ways of the earth, so shall it, ye might be established. I think it's in Proverbs somewhere. Yeah. Memorized it a long time ago. Yeah, he realizes beauty is vanity. All is vanity. <laughs> that would be Ecclesiastes. That would be. Unfortunately, God's enemy Satan has done everything he possibly can to destroy, distort, uh, or exploit what God has made. Think of what the advertising agencies have done with virtually anything that's beautiful. The human body is one of God's most beautiful creations. But think of all the ways that beauty has been, that beauty has been abused by the per, for the purpose of advertising. Just about anything you can imagine. Yes. I mean, you want to advertise soap? Well, you have to have a beautiful woman there to advertise soap, right? Yeah. Would it be correct to suggest that the devil, working through human agencies, has created innumerable experts in error? All the time. How many businesses in our day, including businesses on the internet, are misusing what God has created as beautiful to mislead and tempt people to go astray? Consider some of the ways in which people have been led astray in the past. And I'm quoting from 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and are caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires, which pull them down to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. Good News Bible. Paul, think of all we know about Paul. Paul went on to encourage us to strive for righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Run your best in the race of faith, he said, and you will win the eternal life. We are warned against placing our trust in riches. Instead, we should be rich in good works. James told us that by doing good works, we can store up treasure in heaven. Paul ended up in 1 Timothy 6.20, saying, talking about what some people wrongly called knowledge. What was he talking about? Think of all the things that people have believed for, uh, fervently down through the generations that have turned out to be flatly wrong. A very obvious example, for thousands of years people believed that the earth was the center of the universe and that all those other celestial bodies were doing dances around us. Didn't people die because of finding out that that's not true? And it was flat. Yeah. And other people thought the earth was flat. Yeah. Evolutionary science today posits the idea that life began billions of years ago by chance with no God involved with no purpose behind it. So how should this information impact Christian education? 
for an absolutely fantastic lecture on this subject, see James M. Tour, PhD, and if you want to take a moment, you can actually just look up James Tour on the, on the internet and look for the lecture he gave to Andrews University. This is a guy who says just as loud as he can possibly say it that scientists today are absolutely clueless on how to make even a single cell that's alive. Absolutely. That's his favorite pr expression. They are clueless. And then he goes on to explain why he says that. Proverbs 1 talks about wisdom and foolishness. Verse 7 tells us, to have knowledge you must first have reverence for the Lord. Stupid people have no respect for wisdom and refuse to learn. Solomon went on to describe the folly of people who think that robbery is fun and hope to make themselves rich by doing so. And he concludes that robbery always claims the life of the robber. Solomon went on to describe how wisdom and truth are all around us, constantly seeking to convince us of, the import of their importance. But he said that if you choose evil, you will experience bad consequences. Wisdom cannot come to your aid at that point. But if you choose to follow biblical wisdom, you will be rewarded. You will have nothing of which to be afraid. I just going to help with yeah. a quick comment. Uh, you just mentioned that evil, they want to do way away with the concept of evil. Yeah. There's nothing evil. Yeah. You see? Well, they've, already, they've done away with the devil, so evil has to go next, they right? Are. Right, right. So there is no conscience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Make everything a spectrum well, of good. Yeah, well, I mean, if you, if you believe in evolution, right. where does the conscience come in? But they will uh, have a hierarchy. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Those ones will oh, yes. have a, a hierarchy. Yes. Oh, yes. And there was, that's like in Russia, they, they had the, where they, those yeah. the people yeah. run the show, they live in, in gated communities. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's like that famous film, what was that, that 1884, 1984, something like that. It says, all animals equal, but some are more, more equal more than equal others. Than others. There, you go. <laughs> there was a book, 1884. Uh, no, 1984. Not 19 uh, who wrote it? Huh? Was it George Orwell? Yes. George Orwell, uh, right, right. George yeah. Orwell is the one, right? So where would you f go to find wisdom in our day? Hmm, that's a good question. Wisdom must include a correct understanding of the role of God, not only in creation, but also in our daily lives. It must include an understanding of our total dependence upon God every day. If we recognize God as a source of all wisdom, we will be able to distinguish between right and wrong. Okay, when, where, where does that happen in our brain? Right, wrong. Right in the front part of it, right up here. Okay. Good and evil. Who, distinguish, who teaches us to distinguish good from evil? Truth and error. Evolutionists have a hard time explaining how to deal with moral issues. In the past, and I will just tell you very briefly a story, uh, one of my favorite stories about this. Uh, there was a friend of mine that I know personally. Um, there was back many years ago when he was a teenager, he got interested in soccer. In the United States, soccer wasn't, almost nobody knew anything about soccer back in those days. But UCLA, down in Los Angeles, uh, had a soccer team. And they played other teams that come in, but you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big attraction, so you could just go and sit at the bleachers and, and watch the soccer team for free. You didn't have to pay anything. If you just, anybody you wanted could come watch it. And this guy, this young teenager guy, his, well, actually I should tell you, he started out with a very, very evil background. But he, by just pure luck, well, we would call it pure luck, cra crazy circumstances, he ended up in, in an Adventist school. Mm. He had a, a relative who was an Adventist. It, you know, this guy and all the trouble, he got kicked out of two high schools. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine them agreeing to take him into an Adventist school. But he was, he was fascinated by the, these, these ideas that he'd never heard of before. Mm -hmm. And so he's sitting in the, in the, it was during the summer, and they were having a soccer game at, 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 in, in, there in UCLA. And this guy comes in, sits down beside him, and says they started talking. 
turns out that this guy is a has a PhD, teaches the history of science mm. at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you know, that guy is into big into evolution and this kind of stuff. So my teenage friend, he says, well, no, I have to take the other side. If we both are on the same side here, we won't want anything to talk about. So he's taking strong creationist, art, creationist approach. And they went back and forth. Well, you know, maybe it was like this, and maybe it was this, if God was here, the Big Bang was here, back and forth, back and back and forth, they went. Finally, one, this was Sunday afternoon, one Sunday afternoon, this young man went there and he got to the, to the bleachers before his friend did. And he said, you know, he thought to himself, we were not there at the, when Earth was created. We, 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 you know, you weren't there, I wasn't there. When, the, when his friend came, showed up, he says, I'm going to put a, a question to you. He says, you believe that there was a Big Bang and that as, as things have developed, it's been the, the, the strong have conquered the weak and destroyed them and taken over and everything. So the, the survival of the fittest is the typ typical uh, term that we use talk about, talking about Darwinism. He says, since we we can't go to that end of history back in the beginning we don't you know we can we hear we have these ideas about it but nobody's been there we don't, nobody recorded it for us so let's come to this end of history i believe that we're all created as sons and daughters of god we're supposed to love each other they're supposed to take care of each other when if people, if people has a person a problem we should be helping them etc cetera, etc cetera. now he says to his evolutionist friend he says which one of those words, worlds would you rather live in? Yeah. And this is a kid, probably, right? This is a kid. He's a kid, and this is a That's professor. It's pretty advanced, isn't it? Wow. It's very advanced. And wow. the scientist, believe it or not, the other guy was smart. I mean, he sat there for a moment, he says, you got me. Yeah, beautiful. What was the end of the story? And part of it, it, it as I remember the story uh, from years ago, uh, you live like such and such, but as if there was no pie in the sky, guy, yeah. how would you still conduct yeah. your life? Well, that was another story about the same guy. Yeah. Uh, there was a, when he, he went to UCLA and, and to, to, to actually take, uh, to study uh, f uh, uh, philosophy. It's a really sure, but... Uh, no, he, he went to, he already had a degree in biblical languages. Okay. And when he went to UCLA, he decided he wasn't going to make a lot of money uh, not that he didn't mean to make a lot of money, but he didn't want to just spend his life teaching biblical languages. Yeah. So he said, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to study, uh, uh, not philosophy, but uh, psychology. Right. I'm going to study psychology and, and, and be a counselor. He had two, had two PhDs in yeah. UCLA in Both psychology. Ex experimental and... Um, De probably developmental or something like that. I was like, forgotten the other one. Two PhDs, yes, he got. Anyway, he met with one of his friends. That when the, he, he thought he tried to keep it quiet as long as he could. He, he knew what was hap going to happen in this classroom of psychologists when they found out he, was, he believed in creation. And there's this one guy that just loved to, to you really, really bug him. And one day he was coming up the stairs in the library, and there's this guy coming down. So he says, okay, stop for a second. You like to make fun of me and all my teasers. Let's, let's talk about this. He said, you believe that we live our life here on this earth, and when we die, there's nothing. I believe that when we live here in this life, we, you know, we, we do whatever we're going to do. And when we die, there's a possibility that you can go to heaven and live in the happiest place possible for all of eternity. He says, now let's just assume that 50% there's a chance that you're right, a 50% chance that I, I'm, I'm right. If you're right, we both live, we both die, it's all over. If I'm right, we both live, we die, a, it's all over for you, but I can live for the rest of eternity. And the guy said to him, yeah, but look at all the fun you're missing right now. And he, because of his ex past experience, he said, look, fan, don't give me that because I have been through all that, I have lived all that, I have tried it, I've been to those places, da, da, da. I wouldn't go back to that for anything. I am, I'm very happy with the Christian life I'm being right now. And the guy, nothing more to say. Nothing more to say. Yeah. What did he, was he teaching somewhere then? The yeah, he was, well, he actually worked as a psychologist down in the Glendale area. He was and he, to go to the church I went to. Yeah, oh yeah, he, he, he really lived a Christian oh, life, yes, consistent absolutely. Christian life. Absolutely, yeah. Beautiful.
Anyway, evolutionists have a hard time explaining how to deal with moral issues. In the past, there have been some great scientists who have turned their knowledge and information to very evil causes. Think of those who invented better ways to kill people. Yes. Well, who, well, who's the famous one from the French from the French Revolution? Well, one was Noble. Yeah, but before we but go, Prince Noble Prince. had to had to do with the bombs. Yeah, dynamite, yeah. dynamite. Huh? dynamite. Well, the guillotine. Guillotine. Yeah. 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 The man, the guy said, "We have to kill all these people. Look, we need to find a more efficient way to kill people." And he invented that knife that dropped down and it sliced at an angle like this and cut off people's heads. And quickly, I mean, of course, we know today that's what that's called the guillotine. Yes. And all of his relatives immediately wanted to change their name. They didn't want to have anything to do with the guillotine. And you can understand why. Okay, the Nobel Prize winner. One Nobel Prize winner, an atheist, a man who studies the universe and the physical forces behind it, wrote, The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. What should, what should this tell us about how knowledge in and of itself can not only be meaningless, but even worse, lead to gross error. Yeah, that's from our, from our Adult Sabbath School Teacher's Guide for Wednesday, December 2. If you remember the story of Job, there was those first two chapters that are kind of an introduction and talks about the councils in heaven. And then there's those, what, 36 chapters or something like that of discussion back and forth between Job and his friends, and then suddenly God comes into the picture, and he starts out with Job 38. It's a very interesting chapter where he talks about how he created things and how he set the limits to the ocean and so forth. And one of the famous verses in that chapter is verse 7, In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Now, if you know about Hebrew parallelism, stars goes with heavenly beings. So other parts of the body, when we talk about stars in heaven, if, it, if we don't know for sure it's talking about the stars that we know about, it may be talking about angels. And then the, the um, they sang goes along with shouted for joy. So you can see the parallel. But notice all the other details about how God set boundaries on the ocean, produced water that expands slightly between four degrees and zero degrees. You all know about that? You know, most substances, the colder they get, the more they shrink. Just, and you can go from a gaseous form to a liquid form, and then to a solid form, and it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller as it gets colder and colder. But water, it, it shrinks down like this until you get four degrees centigrade, and then for four degrees, it expands back again as it changes from, from, from liquid to solid. And then after that, it shrinks a little bit. And what is, what, why is that important? If it weren't for that, ice would sink, and life on this world would be impossible. Just how did God make it so that when those molecules came together, Hmm. Just a little bit, just enough so that ice floats and doesn't sink. Yeah. It would never thaw out. Yeah. Couldn't you say that stars sing when you look at those big dishes that they oh, yeah. beam? They've got frequencies that yeah. you can actually hear. Mm hmm I've yeah. often wondered that. Well, their darkness, think about the things that God talks about there in that chapter, darkness and light, um, snow, hail, and rain. Then the author of Job turned to space and talked about the Pleiades and Orion. He challenged us to understand the laws that control these heavenly bodies. Then he acted, asked if humans can control the clouds and tell them when it is time to tip over and dump the rain. Can you find food for lions? Wow. I, all these verses make me think of stories that I wish I had time to talk about. There are many scientists in our world today who believe that, as deists believed in the past, the world comes, the world carries on following laws set in motion long, time, long ago by God, but without God intervening in any way since the beginning. So God set it in motion, but then he's off on a vacation. So. All right. <coughs> Gary, I think she Any does. teach that matter possesses vital power 
that certain properties are imparted to matter, and it is then left to act through its own inherent energy, and that the operations of nature are conducted in harmony with fixed laws, with which God himself cannot interfere. This is false science and is not sustained by the word of God. Nature is the servant of her creator. Nature testifies of an intelligence, a presence, an active energy that works in and through her laws. There is in nature the continual working of the Father and the Son. Christ says, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. And that comes from John 5.17 and Ellen White's Patriarchs and Prophets, page 114, paragraph 4. Okay. So how should we respond when a scientist discovers something of an enormous significance, beauty, and intricacy, and then suggests it all happened by chance? <laughs> Many people have pointed out the numerous, very precisely balanced laws that make it possible for life to exist on this earth. I mean, there's like 50 of those laws which are just exactly right, otherwise life couldn't, couldn't exist. There are many scientists who have demonstrated that there are certain very fixed boundaries to random mutation and natural selection. You know, you can, exchange, you, can, you can select this way and you can select back that way, but you can't go beyond that. By contrast, many scientists claim that a supernatural creator is unscientific. They want to somehow place God in the laboratory where they can test him. A creationist must be cautious when talking to evolutionists. When Christians talk to evolutionists, it is important not to allow the evolutionist to get away with claiming that they have science and all we have is religion or faith. We must demand that if they want to talk about science, we will compare our science, our interpretation of science, with their science and their interpretation of science. That's fine. Science against science? That's fine. We'll do it. And we will be speaking on equal terms. If they want to talk about religion, they can talk about their philosophies and we will talk about our God. Where do we put radioactivity? Some of that we've learned to handle, but why are some ores radioactive and some more than others? Yeah. Yeah. So what does the Bible say about God sustaining us on a daily basis? Acts 17, uh, verses 25 through 28. Nor does he need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. From the one human being, he created all races on earth and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and limits of the places where they would live. He did this so that he would look for him and perhaps find him as they felt about, the, about oh. for him. Yet God is actually not far from any one of us. As someone has said, in him live, we live, we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. Good let, me yeah, let me interrupt there for just a moment. You know, wh that, where was that speech made? Acts 17? Um, this was uh, by St. Paul. Yes, where? A and not Athens. Uh, the, yes. It was Athens? On the On Mars, Mars, Mars Hill, Hill the yeah. Areopagus right. in Athens, yes. Right, right. And he was speaking to, and this is sufficient very sophisticated logic. He even quotes one of their prophets from several hundred years earlier. Paul knew about that guy, and he quotes him. Go ahead, read. Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Now let's interrupt there for a second. What do we mean when we say that? Does it mean God is sitting there going... Tch, tch, tch. No. He said it in motion. He said it in motion, but that's deistic. We have to be careful. What are we re are really saying? It's God who gives the molecules the interactive force, gives the muscles, the designs the muscles so they work in the way they do, and so forth like that. So that, you know, 
he, it's if God just withdrew his hands, those all those laws which make it work would cease to work. He literally he he his energy is what makes it work every moment. Okay? There's gotta be electricity in there somewhere. Yeah. He watches over us. Yeah. But day over us by day, and under his wings we find shelter by night. His preserving care is over us, whether we wake up or sleep. He's as sentinel to guard us from Satan's power, or we should be taken captive by him. Jesus is our constant friend. Ellen White, Review Narrow, December 2, 1890, paragraph 15. Two reasons. Two reasons exist why science, which gets so many things right, gets origins so wrong. For science, which studies the natural world, must look only to the natural world for answers. Second, science assumes that the laws of nature must remain constant. Yet both these are wrong when it comes to origins. Take the first one which requires natural causes for natural key events. That's fine for hurricane tracking, but <laughs> it is worse than worthless for origins that start out in the beginning God created heavens and earth. Genesis 1.1, New King James Version. What can science, which denies the supernatural of origins, teach us about origins that were or totally supernatural? Mm -hmm. Hold on. I'm sorry. Take the... I'm sorry here. Right there. And the const constancy of nature. Uh, this seems to make sense, except Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Mm. Did I? Okay, there you go. Okay. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as though one, uh, through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, and thus death spread all to all men, because all sinned. That, presupposes that verse a natural, pre pre uh, yeah, uh, presupposes a natural environment discontinuous and quantitatively different. Qualitatively. Qualitatively different from anything that science now confronts. So what, what we're saying there, let's just make it very clear, saying what happened at the beginning when things were first built, when first God first made it, there were forces that were taking place that aren't going on anymore. I mean, it, it, and I, this is very simplistic, I'm sure, but we've all, all of us have heard about the famous formula E equals MC squared. And we know that we can, we can put bombs together, nuclear bombs together, and we can release a little bit of that energy, that matter, and turn it, turn it back into energy and make an enormous explosion. Well, what happens in creation? God takes his energy and he squeezes it back into matter. Okay, which one of you scientists can do that? You can't. Yeah. You, know, you can blow it up, but you can't put it back together. So how can you study it? So it, we're talking about something that's discontinuous. It's not something you can go back and test. I'm sorry. Well, you know, that's fine. Uh, a world? From, uh, okay, a world in which death did not exist is radically different from anything we see and can study today. And to assume they were very similar when they weren't also will lead to error. Hence, Science gets origins wrong because it denies two crucial aspects of the creation. Number one, the supernatural force behind it and the radical physical discontinuity between the origin of creation, original creation and what's before us now. When they figure out how to turn energy back into matter, then I'll start listening to them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we know that Christ could have come to this earth as a brilliant scientist and revealed to us hundreds of scientific facts. Ellen White specifically talks about that, many of which we may, may not have yet discovered. But he did not. Instead, he trained as a carpenter in a humble carpenter's shop. What does that tell us about God? 
Diana, I think that's yours, right? Nature is God's 24 hours a day, 3D, multimedia, stereophonic revelation of himself. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) It requires no paid subscriptions, no streaming devices, and is everywhere and always accessible. Psalms 19.1. That's quoted in our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 132. As a... As a branch of science, biology tries to rule out God's creation as an explanation for anything. But if we are willing to consider the biblical record, God created our world without any natural death involved. Apoptosis, the process by which cells are programmed to die and be replaced, is an essential part of biology now. But it was not a part of the original creation in our world. However, God, knowing what was coming, created our world so that we could reproduce and fill the earth with human beings and also study his behavior in sustaining our world as if it were a natural science. For those who are honest with history, there have been so many mistakes made in scientific investigations down through the years that we should be very cautious about jumping on any new so-called truth or any new discovery with, with all fours. Here are two examples, the first of which science should have taken a bow to the church, but didn't, and the second of which the church was a scapegoat for a more general mistake. The following two examples are taken in part from John Lennox, God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? And Jim, I think, you up there? Yeah. Early Christian thinkers, Augustine, Irenaeus, Aquinas, rely on the biblical account, agree that agree that the universe had a beginning and that God created it. However, for much of the modern scientific era, the consensus was that the universe was infinite in both age and extent. When atheists debate Christians on the existence of God, apologists would use the origin of the universe as evidence of God's existence. The atheists respond with the, quotes, fact that the universe was infinite, thereby undermining that argument. Fast forward to the late 20th century, and the consensus among scientists is that the universe indeed did have a beginning, but... Let's stop there for just a second. Notice what we're saying here. Saying that in the old days, the the evolution said, well, the universe is just out there. It's always been out there. Never, there was never any beginning. No, nothing was ever created. Well, now what do they say? Well, Big Bang. We now have a Big Bang. Okay, go ahead. Because it gave Christians justification for the creationist belief. Let that sink in for a moment. The scientific evidence, such as redshift in the lights, excuse me, in the light from distant galaxies and background microwave radiation. Now, let me interrupt there for what do we mean by the redshift? Have you had a chance to study a little bit of astronomy? So the further away things are, these galaxies and stars way, way, way out there, the more the color, we look at it, we, look, we, we know that we have each element has a certain pattern, pattern that which it radiates. You can say, okay, there's a blip there and there's a blip here. Well, if you look at it under a special, uh, it, through, basically through a prism, it, it's, it separates the light, different parts of the light. So you can tell. You go way out there and you find out that the reds, are a little bit slower. And the further out you go, the slower they get. So that means the further things that are out there, the faster they're going away from us. So that's, that's where the Big Bang Theory sort of got its start. How do we explain that? Well, the only way to explain it is that whatever's out there is going away from us faster and faster and faster. The stuff that's close isn't going away very hardly at all. And the further you go out, the faster it's going away from us. So the... the Universe is expanding, is yep. what they're trying to say, okay. Uh, this supposition aligns with the biblical account, but scientists were res- resistant to, that, excuse me, to this conclusion because it gave too much ground f- to religion. Wouldn't it be nice for the scientific community to play fair and s- simply say, we blew it, but, who, but, but those Bible-believing creation, creationist Christians got it right. Uh, yeah, sure. Not today. It doesn't happen. Gary? All right. 
The conflict thesis that says religion and science are fundamentally at loggerheads with each other gets much of its popular steam from stories such as Galileo's. That such stories are given dramatic headlines only reinforces the thesis. Headlines such as Galileo, Secular Scientist, Extraordinaire versus the Church, The Institutional Incarnation of Unscientific Religious Dogma. Wow, what a ridiculous title anyway. Yeah, <laughs> quite involved. Of course, Galileo was right about heliocentrism and the media medieval church was wrong, but the narrative is skewed claiming that this was a clear-cut case of science versus religion and that science won. The fact is, Galileo believed in God and the Bible and did so for his whole life. His initial trouble was not with the church but with the academy. In a letter in 1615, he claims that the academic professors who opposed him tried to influence Roman Catholic Church authorities to speak out against him. Okay, so let's make that very clear. So what's happened? It wasn't the church that was opposed to him and, and holding that view. It was the, the, the scientists of his day that were, because they believed in their idea about those things going up there, you know, those funny circles. And all that stuff. They didn't believe, that, they believed that this earth was the center of the universe. They, they poo-pooed the idea that, that our, our world could be circulating around the sun. So it wasn't the church who was right and Galileo wrong. It was the academy, the scientists, the university professors that were wrong, and they convinced the church to attack Galileo, or Ga Galileo, as you say, or Galileo. Yeah. Okay? Uh, Roman Catholic Church authorities to speak out against him. Yeah. That doesn't, I should have hooked that with it, They convinced the church to speak out against him. Okay. Galileo's scientific arguments were a threat to the reigning Aristotelianism of the academy. Rome aligned itself with a worldview that was supported by the Italian philosophers and professors. This understanding doesn't absolve the Roman Catholic Church of its treatment of Galileo, but it does show that Rome was simply in harmony with the reigning academic paradigm of the day. So to use Galileo as an illustration of scientific, scientists' victory over religion is, this, is to scapegoat the medieval church and distort history. And though the story has been gleefully transformed into the archetypal example of ignorant religionists fighting intellectual progress, the reality remains more complicated. It wasn't just the stark binary of religion versus science. The Galileo, uh, Galileo disaster is an example of the tyranny and dogmatic science and scientific tradition over every other means of acquiring knowledge. And I'm going to let Charles let you pick it up from there. The ignoble, ignoble affair uh, wrote Gerhardt and Michael Hessel associated with the famous trial of Galileo in the 17th century could have been avoided had the church's theological consultants recognized that their interpretation of, the, of certain Bible texts was conditioned by tradition based on the cosmology of pagan mathematical geographer Ptolemy. It wasn't just tradition, uh, tradition but one that arose from the acceptance of the uh, prevailing scientific dogma. Clif Clifford, Clifford Goldstein, Baptizing the Devil, Evolution and Seduction of Christianity. So here's what happened. The, the scientists believed in Ptolemy. Right. And they convinced the church to support that pagan, Ptolemaic version of things. And now they're, they're fighting against Galileo, who was a Christian all his life. And he was telling the truth. So this isn't a case of Christian fail, Christianity fails and, and science wins. It was false science against true science. But what's happening today, right now? Yes. The Pope does not believe in creation. Mm. Yeah. And pendulums has swung all the way around. And he is all ready to proclaim Dios Deus, Day of yeah. the Lord. And you don't believe in creation. Yeah. I do not understand this. Two examples show the battle between faith and science is a straw man in many respects. 
the idea that a big bang cosmology is a de facto concession that creationists were right in the first place is virtually unknown today. Now, the big bang theory for the origin of the universe is used against believers as the argument against the existence of God. Many lay creationists don't realize that their victory trophy, that is, the universe does have a beginning, has been snatched out of their hand and is being used to figuratively clobber them against. Again, yeah. Adult Bible School Class, uh, co Bible co uh, Study Guide, pages 133 and 134. Okay, we're going to have to move forward here because uh, we're running out of time. Christians need to make it clear that many of the greatest scientists of the past have been de dedicated Christians. Isaac Newton wrote several books about his Christian beliefs. Traditionally, there have been five branches of philosophy. You want to just pick those up for us, Diana? Logic, which is ideal thinking. Ethics, ideal behavior. Politics, ideal social organization. Metaphysics, ultimate reality. And aesthetics, ideal form and beauty. Though many of these subjects can be heard by tuning on the radio, tuning on the radio, reflections on beauty have become rare primarily because of the cultural and moral relativism of our age. Beauty is considered simply a subjective uh, preference. Deep down, though, we know that this assertion cannot be true. In fact, just as we know that there are bedrock concepts of the good that are not relative to time, culture, or place, beauty is the same. As one philosopher put it, beauty is goodness made manifest to the senses. Um, so how has evolution impacted our world? How does an evolution or an atheist explain why the humans and even babies are beautiful? Andrew Fletcher, a famous musician from England, once said, let me make the songs of a nation, and I, can, I care not who makes its laws. So how much can young people today impacted by music? And especially the question I want to leave you with, what can we do to teach the truth to our young people who attend such schools, these universities, uh, and teach it so clearly, forcefully, and convincingly that they will not adopt these pagan teachings. That is a major challenge for our church. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come today to consider some of the issues in this very troublesome, very challenging subject. Um, Christian education versus, versus so much of what is being taught in our world today. Help us to see clearly the two sides here and stand firmly and, and convincingly for the truth is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.